Hello and welcome back to another episode of Sierra Unfiltered, which uh, I guess we should talk about. That's only going to be the name for four more episodes. Oh my gosh, you're right. Is that so? Yes. Oh. So Mm. we are officially (laughs) going to be rebranding the podcast. We're doing like a big photo shoot. We just planned all the outfits. Um, and we were pretty much redoing everything. Yes. yes. Yeah. I'm so excited. I can't wait to see it all together. <gasps> it's been so much fun putting it all together. And it, how's it been for you guys? Because this is kind of your first like big influencer project. It's every step of the way. It's just like from deciding what makeup you're going to do, talking to the makeup artist, talking to the photographer, just thinking about his ideas and then com- collabing us together. Yeah. Just and I think like doing something like a project like this big of this magnitude, like for me and like for us has been like, OK, like this is really happening. Like mm-hmm. we're going to have a podcast like mm-hmm. that's going to be like our thing. Yeah. And people are going to listen and see us. <laughs> and like I think that's been the thing I've been thinking about a lot. Like, OK, yeah. like we're going to do this thing. Like there's going to be people like doing like the thing in my DMs and like, <laughs> on, you know what I mean? Like that all yeah. happens. And I feel like it is gonna happen kind of quickly just because we're not starting from scratch like this isn't right you know well and and even for me like you know I've I've been doing this for a while I do a lot of big projects this is probably the biggest project I've ever done in like the photo shoot the set the we're doing a whole new podcast set in here you guys it's gonna be so cool you're not even gonna recognize it yeah Yeah. like this looks like a, a couple of people just set up some microphones and sat down, which to be which fair, they did. They, we, we did. <laughs> but the new one, it's still going to be in this room, but we're trying to make it look like a studio. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. It's going to look like, it's going to be, I feel like we're, it's going to feel like we're on like a TV set, like that, a movie set. Yes. yes. Yeah. And that's yeah. the vibe you want to get, you know, like you show up to set and you're like, let's chat. You yes. Know? Like, yes. Ooh. And that's like, I, I, that's why I'm so glad we're still doing it here because we get the benefit of like, oh, we have a set. It's in this room. We walk right. in, we film. But also, we're not, like, driving to a place. It's, like, at my house, we grabbed LaCroix from the fridge before. Like, (laughs) it's it's very comfy, which is nice. Um, So, yeah, we're really excited about that. That should be end of May, I think. So be looking out for that. Yes. Um, And then today, we are going to talk all things being an influencer, being a content creator. I know Ryan and P have a ton of questions that I'm going to kind of answer for them and for you guys. And then we also pulled uh, questions from the comments. Yes. I think this is going to be a cool way to, like, have this conversation because Mm -hmm. I feel like other YouTubers and influencers will do, like, like an Instagram live or film like a video, you know, and like talk about stuff. But this will be more like actual conversational, like yeah. in the moment questions, mm-hmm. yes. which will be cool. And I haven't looked at the questions at all, but these are the kind of conversations that the three of us have off camera right. Right, all the time. And I've been wanting to do a video about, you know, kind of the ins and outs of being a content creator, but it kind of needs to be long form to like right. actually answer things that people Aren't, that aren't surface level, that people right. don't usually get answers to. And that people can't just, like, look up. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, obviously there's stuff that you can Google and find stuff out, but, like, to know, like, the details and the ins and outs of it, like, is really personal. And it's different yeah. for everybody also. Yes. So I think it would be yeah, cool. Yeah, because her journey is different. Yeah. Yeah. I got to get my pen and paper ready <laughs> because I have some questions. Totally. <laughs> but, yeah, thank you guys so much for everyone who left comments uh, with questions for this podcast on the last episode. Mm-hmm. Um, it was so fun to read through, and I'm just really excited. Yeah, and it, honestly, seeing those questions, I was like, oh, my goodness, I didn't even think about asking that. Let me write that down right. and ask Sierra the right. question. And yeah, the yeah. thing is, for me, I feel like it's kind of, you know, the like having a frog in boiling water, they don't realize it's boiling. Yes. I don't realize a lot of the things mm-hmm. about my job that are weird because I'm the frog in the boiling water and I'm just like this isn't hot this is normal right this is a jacuzzi it's 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 that meme it's that meme with the dog sitting in the house on fire this is fine (laughs) and that's the thing and a lot of the times I don't even think about how things are weird until you guys go wait what right that's how it happened and it happens so often I think we're like what really that's like every day yeah Yeah. yesterday uh Paloma was asking me about like collabs and like oh like how do you meet people for collabs and I was saying that like I like to just collab with people who I've like already met in person but a lot of the times management will like basically set creators up on like blind date collabs of like could you imagine and they were like wait that's real I was like oh yeah that 
that is weird, huh? That, <laughs> like, like, that's weird. Your manager calls you, like, okay, at 2, to, at 2 o'clock, you're going to the Panera, and you're going to meet this other YouTuber. And I'm like, okay, hello, hi, nice to meet you. No, know? like, right, it's yeah. just right. so. Especially if you've only seen them through the screen or if you don't even know them. Yeah, and I, yeah. I did a lot of, not collabs like that, but just, like, meeting creators going out to lunch mm-hmm. early on in my YouTube career, which, and I did make a lot of friends that way. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of the times then when you go right into just, we're filming a video together the first time we meet, mm-hmm. you can tell on camera that, like, right they're not really friends. Right. The, chem- <laughs> the chemistry is off, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's why I, like, it's great now that I just get to, like, film with people that I, like, when I film with Carrie, like, we're, you know, super close. And right, so right. it feels really natural. But anyways, we can get into all of that. Should we just start with Yeah, I think we should just questions? go in. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to go first? And I sound so silly. Like, I feel so silly asking it, but how do you even go or begin to get sponsorship or like brand deals? Okay, Like where? That's a good one, yeah. So early on in my YouTube days, um, you know, there weren't brands reaching out to me when I had 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 subscribers. And so there are these websites where you can submit yourself for a campaign. Oh, okay. Um, so I, cool. I think the one I used early on was called Revfluence, but I don't know if they even exist anymore. There was a couple. There was also one called Clever that I used a lot. And these would be like small budget uh, campaigns, but a lot of the time for big brands. So like mm. a big, pretty well-known brand would post a, a listing saying, you know, we're looking for 10 creators to post a sponsored YouTube video for $300. Mm-hmm. And so I would apply and, you know, you'd answer all these questions and then they'd pick, you know, from the people who'd applied. That was really great for me early on because mm-hmm. otherwise I wasn't able to get brand deals. And at that point right. I was only making like maybe $50 a month from AdSense. Mm-hmm. So then being able to get like a contract for like $300 was like huge. That was right. game changing. And so I would spend, early on, I spent probably three or four hours a week just applying to campaigns on there. Mm. And I got to do some really cool brand deals early on that I don't think I ever would have gotten to do without that. Like, mm. I, I remember when I had, like, 10,000 subscribers, I got to work with Naked Juice from that. Oh, which wow. that To me, that gave me this kind of, like, I guess, validation, mm. you right. know? Mm-hmm. And um, also then when I was putting together my media kit... I was able to say brands I've worked with. I was literally about to ask, does that give, like give you like more credibility? Like I've yes. worked with these other I brands. I think it, it right? gave me a so little. So you should work with me too. Yes. I think it helped me early on with credibility. And also I had no idea how to just cold reach out to brands like that. Right. So these websites really helped me in being able to do that. Mm. And then I later, you know, as my channel grew and I started working with a team, I realized that those websites are really, really, really undervaluing creators. Mm. Um, and so, you know, now I have the the privilege and the ability to not need to do that. And I, right. you know, get brand inquiries just through my management, and through my email. But, you know, early on, even though, okay. yeah, they probably should have been paying me more, mm-hmm. it was worth it. Right, yeah. right. Right now, uh, you talking about that, it got me thinking, right now on TikTok, I see a lot of, they obviously know I'm trying to TikTok, and so they're like, hey, if you want to be a content creator, and they're trying to get out of this space where we don't know. It's like, we don't know how much they're paying, and so they're mm-hmm. like, hey, you need to know how much you need to ask for brands, and saying like, oh, I've uh, asked this brand for this much money. They're kind of just like, it's like a glass door for like mm-hmm. how much you should ask, because they're saying like, they have budgets. You need to ask how much their budgets are before you just say, oh, this is how much I'll do it for. And just like tips like that, right. because if not, they want to- Because you could get more money if you just negotiate Yes, and yes. they want to do that, obviously, to creators, where they're like, oh, well, we sent you product do something and obviously if you're new you're like oh my gosh that's great like you're sending me product pro- free fine. product so mm-hmm. let me do that but they're right. saying no like you could really just like ask for more early on when i was applying through those websites uh, a high school friend her sister worked for one of those and so mm. she that's actually how i found out about it but the first one i ever did she reached out to me she was like hey i'm working on this campaign for like this it's like a sweetener for like mm. like beverage sweetener um someone dropped out last minute we need someone to make a video like tomorrow like mm-hmm. would you be willing to and I was like oh my gosh yes that'd be amazing she said great what's your rate for like an, an integrated video which usually means like one to three minute mention mm-hmm. um and I said fifty dollars and she messaged I think I had ten thousand subscribers at the time I was getting like a thousand views a video she messaged me back and she was like hey as your friend like because right. I was friends with her sister I'm not gonna tell them you said that because their budget is five hundred dollars. 
But right. if it wasn't visit. a family friend who was right. working, They'd she would have like, said, oh, yeah, great, 50 bucks. Yeah, go on in. <laughs> right. And I remember thinking, like, I feeling like I asked for too much. Wow. You know, like, like oh, I... And also, that's another thing is, uh, I guess, just radical honesty for this episode. I used to have a fake email for a fake manager because I knew that people wouldn't take me seriously mm. and that they'd try to take advantage of me. That's smart. No, no that is smart. So yeah. I had a fake manager. As <laughs> Good, you for you. Wow. Good for you. Good for you. Honestly, yeah, yeah. that's smart. But that's and I made like, him a man, too, which I think probably got me better. Smarter. <laughs> but honestly, honestly but think about that. Like, that's, like, shitty. Yeah. That you were, like, well, I'm doing the thing. Why yeah. just show me some respect and, like, Yes. take me seriously like you shouldn't have had to like create this fake like man manager yes. it, it gives you like you said earlier credibility mm-hmm. it just yeah i'm legit know. if you have a man manager yeah yes. you, you it, must be doing something right uh-huh <laughs> and i yeah i would so i made that fake <laughs> manager account and then i actually got a manager uh i think around a hundred thousand subscribers i think um, and so then they would negotiate my deals and manage my inbox and my rates like tripled for a sponsorship when I got a manager mm. just because they knew what to ask, how to ask, who to ask. Right. right. Um, and also a big thing that I was told by actually someone I met at like a YouTube creator event was like, if you're getting more brand inquiries than you can take on your channel, your rate is too low. So like oh. raise, write that down. raise the yeah. rate. And go with the, the higher value ones and do less. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so then before I had a manager, that's how I would decide my rate. Because I didn't really have any creator friends to like talk about it with either. So if I was just, if every brand I was reaching out to said yes, then I'm like, okay, it's time to up my rate. Right. Because this is, I'm making it too easy for them. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And that's just knowing your value. Yeah. Right. That's what they're saying on TikTok. They're like, ladies, know your value. That's what <laughs> the videos are like, you know, just giving no, right. helpful tips. And I'm so glad that there are peach people out there trying to coach uh, like us starting yes. out, like not no, knowing. Because yeah. luckily we don't have not Sierra, has Sierra right here <laughs> right. to ask the question. And that's the thing is that you don't know until you ask. Mm-hmm. Right. Even me now, like I all the time feel weird about asking for stuff. And then like 90% of the time they say yes. Right. You, know? like, you just have to ask. Yeah. Like we're, you know, if I'm traveling somewhere for like a, a shoot my in my brain, I'm like, oh, well. I'll just pay for it myself. And then I'm like, well, I guess I should ask, but I feel bad because they're already paying me to go. So do they really need to pay for my travel? Right. And then right. they say yes. And I'm like, well, well that I just tried. saved me like $1,000. So right, right. I'm glad I asked. But right. especially with, I think when you're a micro influencer working with small brands, the budgets are going to be smaller and it's mutual, right? right? They don't have a big budget. You have a smaller following, but you can work together to learn how to do sponsorships, to bring some credibility to find out what it's like to work with a brand. But when you're working with a big brand, they have the budget. Right. Right. You just got to, but they you don't want to give it say, to you. So you, you just got to pull it out of them. Right. Yeah. All of a sudden, Amazon comes up. I'm like, a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Jeff Bezos, I know you got the bag. Jeff Bezos yeah. himself is delivering your million dollar check. <laughs> yes, in a big check. It's the drone. It's the like He shows up like on a drone or something. No, totally, you know? totally. And anyways. Um, but that actually is a good segue to the que- a question I was going to ask is like, at what point, whether that was following or sponsorships or whatever, were you able to be like, okay, this is my full-time job? Mm-hmm. I, I definitely took a risk. Um, and that's, I think, also where privilege comes in and that I felt like I was able to take that risk because I knew if it didn't work out, I could move back in with my parents. I knew mm-hmm. if I, you know, couldn't pay my bills that I could probably, you know, lean on my parents for that. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I didn't have to, but I knew that I could. Right. And that's where I think that, like, piece of privilege of, like, yes, I worked hard, and like, but yes, I had a, a safety plan and right. that gave me the ability to take that risk. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I think I had around a hundred thousand subscribers. Oh yes, that's right. So I had a video, it was like a slow burn from zero to 20,000 mm-hmm. and then around 30,000 ish subscribers. I had a video go viral and I went to a hundred thousand in less than a week. Wow. And that wow. was nuts and crazy yeah so i i had this video go viral i immediately tried to make a video that was similar so that it would get recommended against it right so then when people were watching the viral one then youtube says here's a similar video right and i basically did that like five videos in a row so that they kept just getting recommended off and off and off of each other right um and so i got to a hundred thousand in less than a week i remember 
because I was teaching voice lessons at the time, I had my live subscriber count open on my laptop next yeah. to like the tab of me like writing notes for my students. And I just like, <laughs> I'd refresh it every like 10 minutes and it'd go up by like 5,000 subscribers. Oh my, oh my God. God. The yeah. thrill it, of that. I, I know. The thrill, it really was. I just couldn't believe it. And so... Um, it was shortly after that, that I, cause I was doing voice lessons at the time. And then I also was a birthday party princess. Yep. And then I also was doing the social media management for the party company. So it was at that point that I quit princessing and social media managing for that company. And I kept doing voice lessons because that was also like a safety net that I knew if views went down or I wasn't getting sponsors that I still had that guaranteed income. Right. Mm -hmm. And Steven and I were living together at the time. And so I knew, okay, like. Hopefully, I'll make good money consistently. But if not, like, he was open to, you know, chipping in a little bit more for rent if needed. Right. Um, So that was another, like, privilege and safety net that I had. But um, so a couple weeks after that viral video, I was like, I'm quitting my princessing job. I'm quitting, you know, social media so that I can't, well, not social, their social media. Right. Definitely not going on social media. Right. But so that I could spend time making those videos to get recommended off of each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but I kept doing voice, which was, I actually did voice up until, I want to say, yeah, I, I was right around my wedding. So up until 2017. Wow. I, yeah. So I did that for a long time. Yeah, I was like, you were, you were like already, yeah, I was I, like pretty big at that that point. I think I had around three hundred thousand, maybe two hundred thousand. I got. Sure. I mean, I remember the wedding video. Yes, and it was <laughs> iconic. I remember. It was, and it was actually, wow. I had been thinking I wanted to quit for a little while, and that I wanted to go full full time with YouTube, but also teaching voice was such great money for only three days a week in the afternoon. So I was like, you know, it's, it, like it's fine. It's fine. It's yeah. fine. I enjoy it, but. I wanted to take time off for my wedding that I didn't have and I was kind of feeling ready anyways and I remember I got one big brand deal like the biggest I had ever been paid that gave me like the courage and the stability to be like you know what this brand deal could pay my rent so I at least am good for a month that's awesome. right <laughs> so I I quit that too but um yeah it, it especially early on and honestly even still now the majority of my social media income is brand deals Mm -hmm. and so back then it would have been a lot longer for me to go full-time if it was just from adsense right and so that's why now like i could if i did no brand deals no sponsorships i could do this full-time just for me Mm -hmm. but i would be making a lot less content a lot lower quality and i wouldn't have a team Mm -hmm. and so having those sponsors and especially regular sponsors like ambassadorships or like monthly deals where I have this guaranteed income for six months or for a year allows me to not only have financial security for myself, but also for my team Mm -hmm. that I now know because I have, you know, a commitment with a brand who I work with on the vlog once a month for the next year, I know I have guaranteed income for not just me, but for everyone on my team for the next year, which is really, really great and nice. And that's why I think sponsors are so important and also like, I, I think early on, people used to get really mad about sponsors. Like, the people yeah. thought it meant you're selling out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think the audiences are a little more open to it now. Yeah. Because they know. They're like, oh, this this helps the creator to, you know, be able to, you know, have a team or to be able to go right. full time on YouTube or right. get new equipment. Um, sorry, I feel like I am talking a mile a minute. <laughs> no, I, this no. is all, so good. And you're so right about that where I see, and I actually see people or influencers get celebrated once they do get their ads. They're like, yes, girl, get your money. Yeah, like you, you see coins. that in the, you yeah. see that now and more than like, oh, she's selling out. Cause you're mm-hmm. like, girl, first sponsor. And just like, I remember like Teffy, like now she's like a big thing. But for a moment she was like, oh my God, I'm doing my first brand deal. And we were like, yes, get the coin. Yeah. Like, and especially when influencers get to partner with a brand that they have talked about organically. Yeah, right. like I got to do an Instagram sponsorship with Disney last year. The uh-huh. comment section was just like, "Oh my god, it happened!" Like I'm so excited yeah, yeah. for you. And not only was that so great for the audience and for me because I knew, like, "Oh my god!" Like they are so happy, they're excited. Mm-hmm. But how great for the brand, right? Like, that that's so good for them. And they're like, "Wow, this was actually a good like yeah. this was a good thing to do. A yes, good per- like a good person to work with. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, that's." I would say one of the biggest ways to support a creator is commenting and saying like, yes, I love this. I love this partnership or I love this video or I love 
the way you did this, especially when working with brands, because they see that and they look for that. Yeah. And they ask for screenshots. And I will make sure to tell all my friends. Yes. Tell them how much you love me in this tide. (laughs) And also, (laughs) if the brand posts content with that influencer, nothing is better than the comments being flooded with people just being like, oh my God, I'm so glad you worked with this creator. I love love that. Love Because the brand is just like, oh, wow. Okay, we should work with them again. Again, And then you have a little room to be like, Okay, so it worked out really well last time. Show so maybe we should, we should exactly. pay a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Show yes. me the money. Yeah. <laughs> That's so fun. Yeah. Wow, imagine. How was that experience? I don't, I don't know. Do we have a time? I know we have to go to a lot, a lot of stuff, but I'm like. We got time. Okay. <laughs> how was it working with Disney? Like that, like it's a big brand. So Such like what are dream. the requirements and just like, you yeah. know, like. I, early on in my, actually when I got my first manager, she asked me to write a list of dream brands that I would want to work with. And I wrote down Disney. Disney, Airy, and I think, yeah, Nintendo. Disney, Airy, and Nintendo. Literally and I have now worked with all three of them, them, which is oh, so yes. cool. Oh, yes, yes. But I would still <laughs> love to work with Disney Parks because, right, yeah, right. Disney no, Parks. Right. Cool. Um, but yeah, working with Disney was so cool. So, like, such a cool experience. We got to, it was Christmas themed. So we got to, like, oh, order all of these Disney um, Christmas decorations. Girl. And then we were all dressed in Disney, which is just so That's cool. The, that's oh so my fun. God. Not, like, cr- not Christmas know, Disney merch. Like, Mickey Mouse, you're like, yeah. And it's Christmas. It's yes. Like, oh. I was oh like, gosh. I would post this without you paying. Right. But, but also, thanks for paying me. No, <laughs> right, right, right. Oh my but gosh. one of the interesting, it, actually, not with Disney in particular, but a lot of the times with big brands that I've worked with, they have really uh, stingent legal requirements, mm-hmm. which I my main goal when I'm doing sponsors is it to feel completely organic. Right. My content doesn't change. I'm just integrating the brand into my content. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But sometimes brands basically, probably their legal department, I think, wants to treat working with influencers with the same stipulations as they do for TV. So like a commercial, like a commercial. Yes. Mm. And so what's really hard is a lot of the times they want uh, no logos, uh, no Mm. brands, which, you know, sometimes it's easy for a shirt, right? You just say, okay, I'm just going to wear a a plain shirt. Right. Right. But sometimes they get so uh, like picky about it that it's like you have to blur the logo on your stove. You have to (laughs) like the artwork on your walls. You need to get a, a a release from the artist to show that in the video. Oh, oh gosh. goodness! Yeah, and so the, co- cover the label on the fridge. Exactly. Right. Well, actually, yes. And oh so I would say ninety five percent of the time, when brands have really strict legal legal requirements like that, even if I love the product, I say no. And even if the pay mm. is great, I say no because I the audience audiences are smart. They right, know. Like, Why is your fridge blurred? Yeah, and, what are we doing? And like, and if I can't Sarah's say a brand weird. name, if instead of saying, "Oh, I'm about to hop on the Peloton bike," all of a sudden I say, "I'm about to hop on my stationary bike, unbranded," they're right. like, "Why are you talking like that?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But there have been a couple that I said yes to just because I love the brand so much, right? And the pay was great. And they were like, you know, hey, we'll we'll work with you on trying to make this feel organic still. Right. But if in a branded video you ever see random things blurred or taped up, that is why. Yeah. Oh, and then a lot of the times they require location releases. Oh so, my god. Wait, what is that? So like if I were to go to Target and vlog, right? Uh-huh. I I am not going in like a TV crew where I get a location release and I talk to their corporate store. Oh, oh. They want you to do that. So if, or if I were to go to the beach with Grace, they would say, you need a location release from the city. Which you just simply can't. Which is, so whenever I have spot, again, that's something where I usually say no, but I have said yes a few times because it was like dream brands. Right. And so then I'm like, okay, I have to figure out a creative idea that I don't have to leave my house for that doesn't involve me saying any brand names or showing any artwork and that still feels organic to the audience. Right. And so there was one, I don't think I can say who it was, but it was a big brand that I love. And so I was willing to do that. Um, and so Jess and I and Kenzie spent about an hour the night before taping up every label in my house just so that I could <laughs> vlog like normal. So like right. on the fridge, we got gaff tape and taped it up, like all that kind of stuff. Listen. It's gotta you be do done. What you gotta it's, do. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. Thing. Like, and I'm I'm still glad I said yes, even yeah. though it's all that work because mm-hmm. it was such a dream. Right. But it's it's all those kind of things where like, 
And and a lot of the times they don't want you to say that or you're not allowed to say that. Right. And so I can't tell people like, oh yeah, sorry, everything is blurred in this video and I'm talking a little weird. It's because the- like this is sponsored. Sierra, yeah. blink twice if you're okay. <laughs> yeah, right, right. She's like, hey guys, yeah. welcome. <laughs> <laughs> So obviously there are some regulations that you have to follow like brand wise cover up the logos. Do you have to follow like a script specifically or you know like what freedom do you have? So it varies a lot from brand to brand. Early on when I was still figuring it out sometimes brands would send contracts or send their talking points and it would literally be like say this verbatim like Mm. as if it's a commercial like Mm. read this Mm. and I figured out very early on that not only does that not feel natural for me but if I read this script verbatim, mm, LaCroix, tastes delicious, bubbly, and my favorite. And then they also do that same brand deal with 10 people. And then after they watch my video, they go to your video and you go, mm, LaCroix, tastes bubbly and delicious. Right. Weird. Right. Because why is everyone referring to Best Fiends in exactly the same way? Oh my God. It also like... Then it is really like you don't believe that. No, like this that's is not you, you really just did this for the coins and yes. like that's your business and whatever. But like, it feels like you didn't even try yes. to make it not weird. And the right. thing is, the the brands that get it get it, and the brands that don't don't mm-hmm. because the brands that have been in this game for a while and are being the most successful at influencer marketing understand that the best way to reach the consumer is organically mm-hmm. right. is for the just to say hey. You like LaCroix? Tell us what you like about LaCroix and then just make sure you say this coupon code at the end or make sure you say our tagline at the end. Right. So usually now with the brands that I work with, um, they'll send a list of talking points and it'll usually be like pick three from this list and say them in your own words. And then usually at the end there's like a line or a coupon code or what they call a CTA, a call to action. Ah, Click the link in my description and you can get 10% off with code... Sierra, Ryan, and Paloma. Oh, yeah. yeah. Look, La- LaCroix. <laughs> Listen. Come on. Which, which, by the way, how I want to know how that works. Like, the affiliate mm. links. Like, oh. you know, just oh, like, yeah, so you sure. give out your code. Now what happens? Yeah, so right. when, when the brand is sponsored, at least in my experience, usually I'm not getting a kickback. Okay. So if they'll give me a code, but my rate is set for them. So they're paying me a set rate. And then they use that code to track how successful the partnership was to decide if they want to do it with me again in the future. So it does, I'm not usually, there have been a couple times where I do get a kickback from the code, but typically I, if people use the code, that does indirectly help me because it's telling the brand that this was successful, but I'm not getting a percentage of that sale. And so that, that would be then the difference between like, affiliate links yes so then the affiliate links are essentially the opposite so the affiliate links is the brand is not paying me directly i have no relationship with this brand um i use a a website called magic links for it and so i basically just copy paste the link of the product put it on magic links they make a bitly out of it Mm -hmm. um and so then i get a commission on anyone who purchases through the link usually between like one and five percent so okay. uh, if I do an affiliate link, I am not getting paid anything up front, nor do I have like a contract with the brand. Right, right. But I get a percentage from sales. Right. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Because it's like, it's like you're being like, oh yeah, like tell them I sent you. It's kind of exactly. like that. Yes, uh, yeah. Let them know I sent you. Mm-hmm. And you probably wouldn't have bought these pants if I didn't show them. No, right. So I'm getting the... Yeah, right. the kickback from gotcha, the brand. Gotcha, gotcha. So actually, let's take a subscriber question Ooh, real quick. Yes. Mm-hmm. Zoe, thank you so much for your comment. Uh, she asked, how do you keep a work-life balance with your employees and set boundaries when there are some of your best friends? Yeah, that's the thing. Is like, it's so fun working with friends. Like, there's a reason that a lot right. of the people I've hired around me were friends first. And the people that I hired who weren't friends first are now also friends, right. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but it is hard where, like, uh, I feel like there's a lot of code switching, if you know what I mean. Yes. Like, especially with Kenzie and I, we'll send emails that are like relatively formal of like, hey, here's my invoice attached. What are the hours for the shoot next Thursday? Is, you know, da 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 da. And then she'll text me and be like, oh my God, ha ha ha, this like dumb meme thing, you know? Right, right. And so I do think there's a lot of like code switching in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I try to be really conscious about like keeping a, a good separation between what is. What are we, what is friend time and what is work time? Yeah. You know, and both can be fun. Sometimes we're having friend time and I'm also vlogging, but, and sometimes we're having work time and 
we're also like chatting and having fun. Right. But I think it, I try to set expectations up front of like, this is us, like we're just hanging out as friends and this is work. Right. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we try to do the same yeah. too. I think so. Cause when, especially like if we show up, like we know we're going to film a podcast, we're like, Hey everyone, like, Hey, blah, blah, blah. This is what we're doing today. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about this. And then after when we're done talking about things we need to talk about, then we can. It's front time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And I also try not to like text people late at night just because I'm working late at night. Um, right. So, like, a lot of the times, you know, if I'm up on my computer at, like, midnight working on something and I think of it, I'm like, oh, I want to tell Jess this. I'm like, text her tomorrow. She, Jess does not work for you at midnight. Right. And so I try to, to keep work stuff within work hours. Right. Is what I try to yeah. do. Yeah. That was a good question. Yeah, that was. I actually have a question. Ooh. Ooh. Um, how does it feel working with your spouse because you do on the IRL channel on the blog channel and behind the scenes I feel like a lot of people don't know but Steven does a whole lot of behind the scenes work Mm -hmm. he is like the finance like he's essentially like the CFO of right yeah IT Steve I we call him IT Steve (laughs) because he's always helping us with like computers and camera and all this stuff um but it's it's fun I really enjoy it I feel like um honestly early on (laughs) Uh, it was not good for us to work together. When mm. I, before I had an editor, a videographer, a producer, any of that, I would just get Steven to help me film. And I would watch all of the like aesthetic lifestyle girlies on YouTube with their, you know, uh, like stabilized slow motion camera shots and perfect all of this. And I wanted my videos to look like that. Mm-hmm. And I had the vision for it. And then I would ask Steven to film for me. And of course, it wouldn't look like that because he is not a videographer. Right. And I think I would get frustrated. And then he felt like I, you know, had these really high expectations that he could never meet. And so early on, I don't think it was good for Mm. us to be working like that together. Now, I love it because Steven does not have to do everything. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, he has his nine to five job and he helps me with stuff on the side and we vlog together, which is very low stress because we're just filming whatever we're doing right and he works on the financial stuff which yes is like working with me but it's very independent work right you know like right. we're not doing collaborative the tax stuff together right. like he's right, taking right. care of it and then running it by me right and with the creative stuff I'll get his input like hey what do you think of this edit or what do you think of this idea but he's not it's not his responsibility to like right do be super involved in that and you have other people that know how to get the angles and do yep. all that stuff. And it's their job it. to do it. Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. so, and I think that's good. And I think I've, I've also learned to just like lower expectations a little bit when you're asking someone to just help. Like when I would ask Steven to help or ask my mom to help early on, I think it, it, it's not good for me to have these like super high expectations for what it should look like. Yeah. But also YouTube back then was so different and that everything oh had to be perfect aesthetic it was like my videos early on were just like four minute videos all voiceover with like the aesthetic sweeping shots and the and the uh transition Uh slides like remember remember back then when they would do like the the neon like triangles that would float around do you remember that that was and i i let me tell you about that because everyone had those same transitions and i was like these are not in final cut pro so how do i get the cool pink triangle zooming out or like the three-toned wipe slide yep so i looked everywhere i wanted (laughs) those lifestyle girly transitions no one talked about where they got them or anything finally i met someone at a youtube event who had those transitions and i was like where did you get those and it was from like a i wish i could remember the company but it was from a company that sells like packs that you buy online mm-hmm. for like thirty dollars, and then it downloads to Final Cut Pro. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. And so then I was able to get all the cool transitions, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. and that was great. And so, but I back then I do think YouTube was a lot less real. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and so now I think if we were ever to go back to the time when it was just Steven and I doing everything, I think it would be a lot easier because there's not as much like need for perfection. I think right. now. I honestly like things to be a little messy and a little real and honest and, you know, not perfectly aesthetic all the time. And so I think my standards just wouldn't be as high, which is interesting because now my platform is so much bigger. Right. You would think think, that the standards would be higher, but instead, and I do think having that like platform and having, you know, a, a, a larger subscriber base gives me that comfort to be like, okay, I don't have to chase views anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, right. people are here. 
if I, even if I posted a video that didn't do super well, it would probably still at least have like, I don't know, 80,000 people watching it. Right. Which is huge. That's a lot of yeah. people. And so I think I, it's given me some comfort, at least in the last, I would say honestly since the beginning of the pandemic, where I like post less and I don't stress as much about what I'm posting because I'm like, I'm not, it's not like in those early days, like I was saying, of refreshing the subscriber count, right. chasing the views, being like, I have to get my videos recommended because what if this all goes away tomorrow? Right. Now I feel a little bit more like comfortable. Mm-hmm. And so I can relax a little bit and do silly videos and not stress about them performing really well. Right. And making content that like you really enjoy like to do. Yeah. Yes. Right. And I think honestly, that was my biggest struggle when I first, I at the beginning of the pandemic, we were like, oh, okay, we're going to try YouTube like we all did. <laughs> and right. what And what we found was, what you have to do is what's trending to first get an audience and it was hard for us to like feel motivated to like want to do it because you're like I don't really want to do that because that's not really what, what we like, want to do what I want to do but I ha- it feels like yes. you have to do that until like we get to you're big enough to then you're do big enough to you, you get to just do what you want yeah. I actually gave a talk on that um at an event and the way I described it was um as an hourglass of trying to reach viewerships When you're at the beginning, you have to do really wide reaching content that everyone wants to see because you're trying to bring in all of that viewership, right? So it's a wide base. You want content that appeals to a lot of people. You want everyone to be able to relate to it. Once you gain a little bit of traction and you have, you know, a couple thousand, maybe 10, 20,000, you want to niche down. You want to make that hourglass Mm -hmm. smaller in the middle to serve the niche audience that you have cultivated Mm -hmm. and be like, I want to reach people who are looking for the content I make instead of just, I want to reach everyone. Right. And then once you have grown past that niche, you can open up the hourglass again because now people are invested in watching you and not necessarily the topic. And I, I feel like that that (laughs) was so, that was so good. I feel like I only reached the top of the hourglass at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, Mm. It was actually after I hit a million subscribers because that was my huge goal that I was chasing. I'm like, I want that gold play button. (laughs) I want a million subscribers. Like, I want to do these really trendy topics and videos to get to that milestone. And then I reached it and I was like, cool. I'm here. Yeah. (laughs) And I realized I'm okay with not growing past this. I really am comfortable at the level of Uh, fame and the reach that I have now where I have an amazing audience oh my god like I everyone tells me all the time like you are so lucky like your audience is freaking cool yeah yeah and I'm like I agree like my my audience is mostly people my age it's like 98% female like Mm -hmm. these are my peers right these are people I would be friends with when I meet viewers out and about I'm like let's go like you and I are we're the same (laughs) right (laughs) right right and so I realized if more people like that reach my content that's cool but also I'm like I'm happy with where I'm at yeah and also I I still live a very normal life you know I think like the top if we're talking like top one percent of creators they they go to Disneyland they get mobbed they can't go to Target they can't they, they have they're in magazines they're in gossip tabloids like they are celebrities. Right. And I am still, I am not a celebrity. I'm still just an influencer. And I don't, I don't think I want to be a celebrity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's what I realized after I hit a million subscribers was I actually don't, I don't think I want 10 million. Mm. I don't think I want to get like just to keep trying to chase that growth. Right. right. And I'm okay if, you know, I, it's not that I don't want new people to find my content. No, sure, right. I, I, that, that's great. But it's not the priority anymore. Mm -hmm. And so then I've been able to open up the top of that hourglass and be like, you know what? I think a lot of the people, yeah, some people are still specifically here for the fashion content, but also I think it's, I've seen it, especially in the vlog, people are pretty down to just watch me do the stuff I like to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Like the amount of positive feedback I got on my like rock tumbling. Right now. (laughs) Like like my gardening, like, and how right. lucky to have this audience who's just like, hey, we just want to watch you be yourself. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, I would so much rather have that than have 10 times the audience I have and not have that like personal connection. And making content that you ultimately like 
don't love. really it kind of feels yeah. like you know yeah the opposite yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it kind of feels like when they tell you you want to have it's like the quality of friends like the, not the quantity mm. you know you're not mm. trying yes. to have as all the friends and popular or whatever yeah. but it's like you don't have so much substance but then when you have a small tighter group you're like and you know what we all and also love and support each other here and it's so great that your fans are like that. yeah oh yeah. yeah oh yeah and i'm so lucky and i don't want to sit here and be like don't t- chase the trends because I have, like, you kind of have to do that starting yeah. out. No, I right. am sitting here now, you know, eight years later being able to say, I don't have to do the trends. Like, don't chase the trending videos. Just right, be just yourself. Just do what you love. <laughs> and it's like, of course I get to say that because I, you know, right. but at the beginning, like, if I hadn't chased those trends and put all the hashtags I could and tried <laughs> all of these trending things, I right. wouldn't have gotten to the point where now I can do pretty much like whatever, whatever the fuck I want. Yeah. 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 No, right. Yeah. And that's and that's like the goal. And I think I think that's what's really cool about TikTok. Yes, is that you don't really have to do things that are trendy. Like you should, and like if you're trying to grow, like then cool. But like you could be doing something completely random, anything, and go viral. I love TikTok for that. I think TikTok is the easiest platform to grow on, but also they they don't pay much at all. Yeah. They have the creator mm-hmm. fund. I've done a couple sponsorships on TikTok, which have been cool, but. YouTube, I think, is definitely, in my experience, the best to their creators, mm-hmm. and they also pay the best. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So, gotcha. like, I've never had a contact at TikTok or Instagram or Twitter to reach out to me and say, hey, you know, you're creating content on our platform that's making us a lot of money. How can we help you? Right. Um, oh, okay. Like, even, like, I, I remember trying to get verified on Instagram, and I could not get a hold of a single person. Like, so I'm not verified on TikTok. And, like, that's fine. But YouTube, they – I have a partner manager there who basically helps me to look back at my analytics, see what did well, to help me get brand deals and opportunities who I don't pay a dime. Which is interesting because you'd think they'd want to help you because you're helping be on the platform. Right. And I know YouTube gets a lot of criticism and, like, as a company. And I do think, you know, some of it rightfully so. But I – they, I think – treat their creators very well. And the split, I believe, with YouTube is uh, for AdSense, 45%, I think, goes to the creator and 55% for YouTube, which that's pretty sound, good, that's though. actually, yeah, it's that's like pretty almost good. Almost half. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's pretty good. Um, I know now there's like more hurdles to get into the, the partner program where you mm. can get ads, mm. but I think like it, it, it's a, I think YouTube has the best possibility for making good money for like oh. the social media platforms. But it's hard. It's so hard to grow on YouTube, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the, that's the drawback, right? Like yes. TikTok, you can grow and you got you know a bunch of followers, but like you're not really making a lot. YouTube takes forever, but when you get there, yes. you're getting the money. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so actually, a lot of the subscriber questions were about filming in public and being recognized in public and being with other people when that's happening. Oh, okay. So yeah, filming in public is one of those things that just always feels awkward. Right. But I do think. <laughs> like you get a little more used to it and I think when like at least for me I started to feel more comfortable filming in public when I went full-time on YouTube because I was like this is my job right like, I, ha- right. I have to do this just right. get out this of my way doing. I need to do it yeah, yeah. you gotta get the shot <laughs> exactly to get the shot yeah. and I I wish I could go back and tell smaller influencer Sierra like act with that confidence now mm. right because no one out there knows how many subscribers you have Right. No, none of the people looking at you at Target know if you have five subscribers or 50 million. Right. So act with the confidence like you have 50 million. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think, yeah, like it, it's a little embarrassing. Yeah. But you just got to do, do it. it. Yeah. I know. I'm still and trying to do that, especially with too. myself eating at restaurants. I'll like prop myself up and just like eat. And then like or like sometimes I'll notice someone behind like I can see in the camera. They're just like literally watching. Yes. They're the literally camera. directly watching at the camera. And I'm like, girl, look away. <laughs> look away. And, but, and I do think it's a balance, right? Of like, yeah. I want to film myself in public, but I want to be respectful of where I'm filming. And if yes. right. people are in the background, I don't want to just walk in and be like, I have to film myself because I'm an influencer. Like, uh. right. So I I never want to do that. And so I do try to be, you know, really respectful. Anytime if I'm ever asked to put my camera away, of course I do. Right. I will say that never happens in San Diego. In LA, it must be so much harder to be a vlogger because they have all these requirements. It's so tough. I remember I took one step into an Urban Outfitters, wasn't filming, just had my camera in my hand. They're like, you cannot film here. Mm -hmm. I'm like, got it. Yep, understood yep. yep um so i try to be respectful of that and then also like not filming strangers or if right. there's like 
people that are, you know, if people are in passing in the background, like, that's fine. But if someone's ever, like, their face is, like, in the background, I just blur it because, like, they're just trying to do their grocery shopping. They right. did not ask to be on camera. Right. I want to make sure I'm always being respectful of that. Um, and then, oh, second part of the question was, like, being recognized. Um, I love meeting viewers. COVID definitely makes things a little more complicated. Right. Because it's, like, I... Do we take a picture? Do we right. hug? Like before right. COVID, it was just like, oh my God, hi, thanks so much for watching. Right. And now I feel like on both ends, like it's kind of been we reeled back a little bit. Uh, the one thing I will say that I don't think I've talked about before, I would bet money that 95% of creators would be able to know if someone has recognized them without them saying anything. Yes. There's a look. There's a vibe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, There's yeah. like, they're just kind of, they're not staring, but it's like a lingering and then looking away. Yeah, and yeah. like, I get it, because I've definitely done that when I saw, like, influencers I recognize out in public, but you don't want to say hi. So, like, they know. (laughs) It's the eyes. Yeah. Like, I I, I know, and I can usually tell. And so, at that point, like, I'm totally cool with people coming up, because I probably already clocked it. (laughs) Right. 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 You're like, just come over already at this point. Do you have people, sorry. No, go, go, Do you have people that try to, like, take pictures of you and not pictures with you? I have only had that happen once. That's weird. Um, and that made like me that. really uncomfortable. And that's, yeah. again, with the thing where, like, I don't necessarily want to be bigger. Right. Because right now I think people feel comfortable just coming up to me. And I like that. And no one really, like, people don't, like, freak out or, like, mm-hmm. scream. or right. Especially because right. I think my audience is a little older. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not having, like, kids come up to me. Right. It's, like, mostly women who are in, like, their 20s and 30s and sometimes late teens. And so they're not, like oh my god like right. freaking out they're just like right. hey I just wanted to tell you like I love your content and yeah. then I'm like oh my god thank you so much we get to talk and so it's like a very kind of chill interaction yeah 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 and if you were bigger like it'd be like paparazzi pictures kind of yeah like, that's what that's like when you're trying to take pictures of someone but not yeah, yeah. It, with their knowledge like that's, that's weird weird so, that's well really weird. someone took a picture of me like at the self-checkout at target and then like dm'd it to me and was like i just is i just saw you at target and i'm like this is weird please don't like i don't yeah. i'm in my pajamas i did not like this is weird right. i probably have like my sweatpants like wedging up my butt crack like <laughs> i don't i don't want i don't want this picture to exist <laughs> right right and, and then to send it to me right and hey, so being like hey i think i saw you in target like yeah. why don't you just say that yeah that's so creepy just yeah. like opening a picture of you of like me imagine you're like target. you look behind because yourself, you're, like, you're oh looking up you're like yeah so that <laughs> that weird. is uncomfortable that. but i will say only happened to me once. Mm. Only once. That's good. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Just be like, hey, <laughs> yeah. let's take a picture. I would rather. Yeah. Then I can get ready. I can, I can, yeah. We can do a thing. Yeah. Right. I can turn the wedgied sweatpants around. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So we had another uh, subscriber question, um, yes. which was really good. And I genuinely want to know, like, how this goes. So um, they said, how do you deal with hate and malicious criticism? The main reason I haven't started a YouTube channel is because I'm afraid of getting hurt by comments. Sad face. That, like, hurts my heart because my first instinct is to say, no, just do it. Like, it doesn't matter about the hate, right? Like, I think that's very easy to say from the outside of, like, ignore the haters. Like, they don't matter. But the truth is, like, though, especially for, like, people who are sensitive to that kind of stuff, it hurts sometimes. Especially the things that are, like, really pointed and that sometimes uh, are things that you are personally insecure about or things that are maybe a little too true. You know, mm. like I, I'm aware that I'm like a very, you know, loud, talkative person. And so sometimes when people say things like, oh my God, like she's the most annoying person I've ever met, you know, she like, it's just so loud and she talks nonstop. I'm like, oh, maybe I should talk a little less. Like maybe I am a little bit much, you know, cause that's yeah. like a, yeah. an already an insecurity of mine. Right. Yeah. Whereas when people just say like, you're dumb and fat, I'm like, great. Like that, is, that, uh, yes. that right. You're like okay. Does not bother me at all because right. that's like it's not really even personal. It's not about me. Right. Right. And so, but I one thing I will say about being a content creator is I think a lot of the times when influencers talk about how hard this job is, mm-hmm. it comes across as really tone deaf. Right. And I'm aware of that. Like I'm aware that this is a huge blessing. Mm-hmm. I am so lucky. I have one of the coolest jobs I could ever imagine. And that's a huge privilege. And so I I totally understand from the viewer perspective to see someone essentially living this dream that you would love to live 
and while you're working, you know, a traditional job and they're saying, oh, my life is just so hard. Being an influencer is so hard. It's so frustrating because you're like, I would love to have that job. Right. And you're sitting there complaining about it. So like, I am very aware of that. And that's why I, I don't want to complain too much about it. But I do think being an influencer has unique hardships. Things that at a normal job you would not have to deal with. Like, you know how people always say, like, oh, you know, no one's looking at you. People are too worried uh, worried thinking right. about themselves. No one's actually thinking these things about you. That's actually not true as an influencer. Like, people right. are looking at me and overanalyzing me. And there are people who want to see me fail. And they're telling you. Mm-hmm. And they're telling me, That's yes. right. Because you can think whatever you want about other people. And you don't often, like really say that yes. but people go out of their way to, to tell to an take influencer the time. And it's yes. the taking that they the time don't like to, them or yeah. whatever it is and and that yeah. is a like uniquely it. hard thing that I think a lot of the times when influencers talk about how hard it is they, they're thinking oh my god how nice would it be to have a, a quote unquote normal job where there aren't thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people analyzing and criticizing mm-hmm. every little thing about me Yeah, right. um, I think you have to be a pretty secure with yourself to right. to be able to withstand, you know, the not even just the hate, but specifically the criticism and the overanalyzing. Um, I think that can feel really personal sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and so while I want to say to this person, like, don't, like, screw the haters, just make your content, like, I think it's also okay to, like, be human and, like, be right. hurt by those things. And, yeah. like, that that's just the way it is because in real life, a thousand people a day are not walking up to you and going, oh, my God, you're the ugliest person I've ever seen and I right. hate your style. No one's right. doing But then when right. you're an influencer, right. if you're reading that, like, if someone just walked up to you on the street and said that, that would ruin your day. Right. You'd be like, like Hello? And you think about that for so long. Right. And I think we expect on the internet to just brush it off. Right, because you're like, it's just comment, who cares? It's just comment, who cares? But I I think it's okay to, like, be a little hurt by it. I wish I wasn't, you know? Like, I watch people like Aspen Ovard, who is just truly, like, could not care about what, at least it seems, you know, it's, like, very, like, I think it's funny when people, like, hate comment. I wish I could be like that. And with some topics, I am. Yeah. But it is hard sometimes, Yeah. you know? Especially when it's, like, preying on your insecurities. Right. Right. And then on the flip side of that, like, not to derail, but, like, it's, it's also, like, how do you handle the other side, the adoration, like, people being mm. obsessed with you and then all that going to your head because, yeah, it's great if people are like, I'm obsessed with you, I love you, like, this and everything you do is perfect, you're perfect, but, like, if you're not a grounded person or, like, a centered oh person, God. I can't imagine. Mm-hmm. I mean, celebrities, like, right actors and... Get off your ass and effing work. <sighs> yep, It yep. seems like nobody, nobody wants to work these days. days. That's, like, my worst my fear. Song. <laughs> it's <laughs> true. I'm like, what? Could I... If I didn't have Steven and my friends and you guys who, like, keep me grounded, could I become that if I, like, lived right. in this bubble long enough? Right. Could it go to my head where I really think that way and talk that way? Like... That's a little scary. That is right. scary. Like, you're like, you're delusional. That's delusional. Yes. Like, what world do you live in? Not mine. Yeah. Yeah. No. And absolutely. not the majority of people's. Like. Yeah. Bro, it's the, yeah, true. Yeah. They were like. They were. Not mm, so true. Yeah. So <laughs> and that, and I know it's like her just like agreeing, but it felt so like, ye, like, yeah. clearly but agreeing also, like, with. She what, thinks that way too. So if you're surrounded by people who think yes. that way and are feeding into that, like, yeah. why wouldn't she think that that was Everyone reality? on set yeah. who has been there since Dude. 4 a.m. <laughs> they're she like. talks of people being like the, the PA who like just spent 30 hours peeling labels off water bottles. Yes. Like, to get paid 925 an hour. Nobody wants to work and they're like. Oh, they're like oh, and so, God. right. That is the other side of that, of like. Okay, I am so happy that I have this loving, welcoming audience, but how do I not let it go to my head? Yeah. And I think it's surrounding yourself with people who keep you grounded. I think, honestly, living in San Diego helps me a lot. I think mm. when I go to LA, I become a little bit more influencer which is fine. Right, right. Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah, yeah. If she's like, I'm in LA. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. an LA girly now. <laughs> right. But if I stayed there, and was only around other influencers right. and no one who had a normal nine to five and no one who didn't have a platform, who would I become? Yeah. I don't know if I want to know the answer to that because I 
I really like who I am. Like no. I, I like we like who you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Imagine staying a weekend at the hype house. You leave it. No way. And you are like completely like. I you walk are. out with the little tiny sunglasses. Delusion. Yeah. Yeah. Delusion. <laughs> Steven's like, hello. Who are you? Hello. <laughs> Steven You're comes not to, to pick to her up. Yeah. 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 She has like the nails because here's yeah. like, it's oh, yeah, it's I, very much like that. You know when you put on nails and you just all of a sudden just give like, yourself a little bit more. Eh. You yeah. just want to do more. Yeah. It's like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that. But in the worst way. Yeah. Right, 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 right. And so I, you know, I try to, I, I think that there's those two sides, right? Of like not wanting the the positivity to go to your head too much, not letting the negativity bring you down. Um, and then I think there's also the middle ground of valid criticism. Yes. And I don't want to be a person who puts all criticism into the mindless hate comment category. Right. Because I think that sometimes then can lead to people becoming that like you're just hating on me like you're yeah, just a hater yeah. when you're they're just, just trying to like either right. educate you or yes. make right. you aware of something and I think I used to be a lot more defensive mm. and I think in the past three years or so I've really learned that like criticism and like especially criticism that's like very kind and respectful mm-hmm. is not it, it's it's not something that I need to brush off it's something that I need to take in you know right. mm-hmm. and say okay if people are saying that the way I said this or the way that I did this offended them, maybe I should look into that and change that. And yeah. there have been a lot of things that I've changed the way I talk about things. I've changed the way that I refer to things. I've changed the verbiage I use, the the way that I'm showing things because I've gotten that positive feedback. And I want my audience, I want you guys to mm-hmm. know, I want that. I welcome that. Like, make me better. Mm-hmm. Right. And Will I be able to listen to every piece of feedback and change everything everyone asks me? Absolutely not. Right. But I want to hear it. And mm-hmm. I want to know. And I want my audience to feel like they can tell me in a kind way. You right. know? Right. Yeah. And I, I want to hear it. Yeah. Right. That's so good. It's all so good. But but I have one more question because okay. we've just gone over so much. But and coming from like a new creator just starting out, like what is your advice? What is the takeaway, mm-hmm. the little nugget that I need? Okay. I Oof. think oh, that's that okay. was so good. That's so good. Um, okay. First, I would say number one is uh, creating content that you like on a sustainable schedule. Mm. I think the vast, I don't have any actual data on this, but I would guess, and from my experience, the vast majority of people who start social media or start a YouTube channel don't make it past the first six months. Mm. And a lot of the times they post a ton in like the first couple weeks or the first month because they're excited about it they're like I love the content I'm making I want to make it I see this feature for myself um and they make you know 10 videos in a week and they post them all and then they're burnt out and they're like okay I just I can't do this anymore right um so I think as excited as you are like yes take advantage of that energy and that excitement and if you want to batch film sure but hold on to it you know post once a week twice a week if you're on TikTok post once a day at least Find a way to make it sustainable because the the reality is most people tap out before they even have the opportunity to make it. Oh mm. my god, I feel that. I literally feel that. Yeah. I was looking at my YouTube channel today, like literally this morning, and I was going through. I was looking at all the videos I'd posted, and there I've posted a lot of videos throughout the past six years, mm-hmm. six or seven years, and there was so many videos at the beginning. And I was like, I can't. And then there's years in between of yeah. nothing. Yeah. And I think it's so much better to start off small at the beginning. Don't bite off more than you can chew so that it can be sustainable. Because right. it can take people. I mean, it took me two years to have my first viral video. I Like someone like Mr. Beast, who's like one of the biggest creators, has talked about how he was like a creator for like 10 years before oh things goodness. took off. And wow. now he's like one of the biggest right. content right. creators on YouTube. Like I think imagine all of the people who could have been the next Liza Koshy, the next right. Mr. Beast, the next whoever, but tapped out before they hit their stride. Oof. Yeah. So I think That's good. it would be a stick shame. with it. It was just such a shame, right? Yeah. Um, and I think my second piece of advice is don't overthink it. Start today. Start yesterday. Start tomorrow. Like yeah. just I think it's so easy to get in your head about it and be like, I want to make it perfect. I want to do this and that. Yeah. Make make a hundred bad videos. Mm -hmm. learn how to film as you go you don't have to know everything from the start learn how to edit if you have an iphone you have an excellent camera Mm -hmm. you have you can edit on your phone iMovie is free like start now and you can learn as you go and Mm -hmm. the best thing 
that you can hope for is that you look back on those earlier videos and you cringe mm-hmm. because right the, that means but back did. then mm-hmm. that was the best you could do mm-hmm. yeah but now you've gotten so much better so i think start today mm-hmm. be s- sustainable with I your know. schedule am i yeah. gonna cry i know <laughs> i know this is so good and uh i guess third because I, I love doing things in threes don't be afraid to advocate for yourself like you have value you have a unique perspective you even if your audience is small like there's something special about you and don't be afraid to advocate for yourself and say I know I'm worth more than this Mm. um and I think that's the like the most important things I'm sure there's a million other things (laughs) that we could dive into (laughs) Um, and also I feel like I've talked the vast majority of this podcast <laughs> and again, insecurity of mine that I talk too much. So right. I'm like, I already know there's gonna, I'm anticipating the comments being like, Sierra just doesn't stop. Which I, I agree. I don't. Right. But that being said, I would love to do kind of a part two of this, mm-hmm. um, maybe in a couple weeks, uh, where you guys talk about more about your experiences, learning the ropes of being an influencer. I right. would love that. And I and it would be so fun to revisit that and be like, oh my God, at that point I only had like this and now I feel I'm at this point and I'm doing all these things. And I can ask you guys questions. Oh no. Yes. Oh my What's God. your content yes. schedule? How's it going? Have you figured out the equipment stuff? Have you figured out the editing, the transition? Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. yes. That'd be great. That would be so fun. Okay. Well, I guess that is going to be it for this podcast. I had such a blast. I, me too. And I learned, I, so, I learned much. so much and I hope that you guys learned a lot too and like it was inspiring mm-hmm. for you start today yep start today mm-hmm. um, I feel really inspired yeah. too oh yeah. good I'm so glad I love talking about this stuff like and that's why I'm so excited that like in person events are coming back like Ryan mm-hmm. and I are going to and Jess are going to this uh, convention called Clamor and then I'm going to VidCon and like I, I want those things again because yeah. I love just sitting around and like talking about this yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm excited about it. But um, I guess I can stop rambling now. Uh, <laughs> give us uh, a review on Apple Podcasts, five stars. They do stars, right? I think so. Yeah. What? What, whatever you can give us. Whatever you do, give it to do us. it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you can subscribe on YouTube to watch the video version. And uh, follow Brian and Paloma because we want to see them be superstars. Yes. Please. Superstar. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.